Okay, for, for those of you who are logging in, we'll be getting starting, uh, started momentarily. Uh, appreciate everyone's participation uh, today. Okay. And just, just, just as if it was, uh, I, I guess, at a movie theater or something, and letting everyone get seated and get their popcorn, and we're about to get started here. Uh, okay, well, good morning. Uh, welcome to the BIA Southern California's Front Row webinar series. Uh, my name is Carlos Rodriguez. I serve as Executive Officer for the BIA Baldy View Chapter. I'm excited today to have uh, a really great lineup of distinguished leaders uh, for you uh, all watching today. Uh, today we're going to have our BIA Baldy View Chapter Mayor's Forum, and we're going to learn about uh, the economic impact of COVID-19 on local development, city budgets, and strategies to maintain a high level of quality of life services. For those of you uh, watching, we'd like you to be interactive and it would encourage each of you to uh, please submit any questions that you have and get those in the queue. And then what we'll do today is uh, we'll, uh, toward the uh, mid or latter part of the program have an opportunity to take those questions. Uh, but first, it'll be my honor to uh, introduce each of our uh, great lineup of mayors today, starting with our uh, Chino Hills Mayor Art Bennett. And we also have a Highland Mayor Larry McCallan, uh, Rialto Mayor Deborah Robertson, and of course, Fontana Mayor Aquanetta Warren. Each of them are gonna uh, take a moment to provide some opening remarks. We'll start with uh, Chino Hills Mayor Art Bennett and a few things about uh, the good Mayor Bennett. He was elected to serve his, his third term on the Chino Hills uh, City Council in 2016. And he was first appointed uh, to the council back in 2008. Uh, he uh, also, uh, as mentioned, was uh, reelected in, in 2016 and has served as mayor both in 2012 and uh, 2016. Uh, he first became active in public service back in 1993 when he worked to develop the city's first general plan as a member, uh, a, uh, member of the General Plan Advisory Committee. Uh, and he, again, he served for 14 years with distinction uh, and we're delighted to have uh, Chino Hills Mayor Art Bennett for some opening remarks. Art? All right. Well, good morning, Carlos, and good morning, all that uh, are, are checked in. Uh, I'm very proud to uh, represent the city of Chino Hills. Uh, we are a fairly new city in that we were incorporated back on December 1st of 1991. So uh, we are relatively new, but um, because of the leadership of prior council members and uh, we today are really, really proud of the fact that we are uh, fiscally in good shape. Uh, we will talk a little bit later about some of the challenges that COVID-19 is presenting currently in our current budget and, and what we're forecasting for the, for the coming year. But, you know, the challenges that we have uh, gone through really are pretty much the same that every, every city, uh, I think, nationally is coming up with. Uh, because we have had the stay-at-home order, uh, maintaining lines of communications with our residents has been a very, very critical thing. Uh, we don't want anyone to believe that they're all out there all, 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 you know, by themselves. We want to impress the importance of the stay at home, the social distancing, the wearing of face masks or face coverings. And of course, our county has come up with the edict that now face coverings are uh, optional but we still try to impress upon that uh, they should be, although not mon mandatory, they should in fact be worn all the time. Uh, we're trying to assure residents that we will maintain city services during this time. Uh, it is somewhat of a challenge because uh, we have, when we say city services, all of the, the daily nuts and bolts with public works and making sure that uh, people get water, that they can flush their toilets, that the streets are going to be swept, that the street repairs are going to be made. Uh, all of those things are happening and they're pretty much seamless regardless. But the thing that has really impacted our uh, residents the most is the uh, absolute closure of City Hall itself and all of the programs that have been closed. Uh, we've been dealing with the closures of recreation, parks, trails, 
uh, things of this nature, which we we tout in the fact uh, of Chino Hills as being a rural atmosphere in a metropolitan setting, but we have uh, 3,000 acres of open space. We have 44 parks. We have 48 miles of, of trails. And one of the challenges has been not only keeping our residents off of these facilities while we're uh, in the shutdown phase, but we are in the four corners. We are close to Los Angeles County, Orange County, Riverside County, and a lot of people from other areas love to visit our uh, outdoor facilities, the parks and the trails. So trying to get them to adhere to the same standards that our residents are uh, expected to do has been a real challenge for us. But uh, as we get into the actual fiscal effects and everything of COVID-19, uh, I'll share more with you. But uh, it is my pleasure to uh, represent the, the council. Uh, I have fellow council members, uh, Vice Mayor Brian Joes, uh, Cynthia Moran, Ray Marquez, and Peter Rogers. Uh, they all serve with distinction the residents of this city and we are very, very proud of the uh, distinction that we've had in this short period of time that we've been a city uh, to be one that's very, very much sought after as being a place that people want to come and live. Uh, I view Chino Hills as kind of my sanctuary. I, for many, many years, worked downtown Los Angeles and had to endure that uh, commute. Uh, for a while, I drove. For a while, I took Metrolink. I took the bus. You name it. Uh, it, it was a long commute into downtown Los Angeles, but every evening when I was coming home and I'd go over the hills coming out of Diamond Bar, Los Angeles County, over into Chino Hills, and you'd see the cows grazing on the hills or the, the sheep that are up there taking down the weeds, uh, it, it was uh, coming home to my sanctuary and my little castle. So it's, it's a wonderful uh, city that we're very, very proud of. So uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, give those few remarks. Thank you, Mayor Bennett. I appreciate uh, you being here today. And uh, we have uh, four great friends of, of the industry uh, here today and uh, grateful to have the mayor of, of Highland, Larry McCallan. Uh, and Larry was elected uh, to the council in 2002. Uh, in 2015, he was elected uh, by the 16 cities of San Bernardino County uh, to serve on uh, the uh, governing board of the South Coast Air Quality Management District. He is a past president of the Southern California Association of Governments as well, and he, uh, he currently uh, serves on the regional uh, council. Uh, we've always had an opportunity uh, to uh, work with him in close concert at those regional levels as well as in his role on, on the council in, in Highland. Uh, he's also a, a past president of the League of California Cities Inland Empire Division and uh, received uh, uh, the uh, James Stallman Memorial Public Service Award, uh, as well as a uh, Good Government Award for the, from the BIA when he served as SCAG president for their noteworthy development of a Southern California economic recovery and job creation strategy. My pleasure to introduce Highland Mayor Larry McCallan. Good morning, Larry. Let me unmute there. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you very much, Carlos, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, glad to be here with everyone. Uh, thank all of those who are participating. Uh, I think it's important to understand our city if I start at the beginning. We were incorporated in 1987. And at that time, the LAFCO staff uh, said we could not survive financially as a city. Yet. 33 years later, here we are, still alive and still thriving. And that's due primarily to uh, conservative fiscal policies and management of, of, of the staff and past city councils uh, since we've been incorporated. I think our mission statement really says it all, and I'll quote it, says Highland is dedicated to the betterment of the individual, the family, the neighborhood, and the community the city council and the staff of Highland are dedicated to providing the quality of public facilities and services that its citizens are willing to fund and will do so as efficiently as possible. Uh, and I think that en encompasses our philosophy here in the city. We're a contract city. We're about 55,000 in population 
uh, we have 35 full-time employees. Uh, we're, uh, we contract uh, with the county sheriff for police, Cal Fire for firefighters and paramedic personnel. We have a franchise uh, agreement with Burtek for waste hauling. Uh, East Valley Water District provides our water and sewer uh, services. YMCA uh, provides our recreation. And some of our engineering services like plan check, et cetera, are also contracted out. We uh, have established uh, an economic uncertainty fund, uh, unlike some others. Uh, we've never had any bonded indebtedness as a city. Uh, we have this pay-as-you-go philosophy. We don't go in debt. We only spend what we can, can afford and can take in. Our current citizens do not uh, subsidize new development. Uh, we don't uh, ask them to pay for uh, the development of, of, uh, of uh, any uh, uh, project. The only debt carried by the city is the unfunded pension liability, which is currently about $4 million for our city, which is probably one of the lowest in the whole county area. We have an account into which we put funds to uh, uh, pay off this uh, unfunded liability if we so choose, but uh, you know, if you pay it off, the market goes up and down. And if you've got money in there uh, and it's access to the requirements, uh, you don't have any access to it. So we choose not to pay it off, uh, but we keep monies aside to do that if we need to. Major sources of our city funding are. Uh, as follows, the vehicle license fee, uh, the property tax and sales tax in that order. Sales tax is the least amount of funding that we receive for the city. Uh, the impact of the COVID-19 to us is uh, no real funding impacts in the near term since the property taxes are not impacted and We'll, it will be a problem if the economic recovery is longer than a year. Sales tax revenue, not much affected since most of our sales tax is from essential businesses like Lowe's and supermarkets and uh, rest, fast food restaurants, uh, pick up uh, delivery of food, et cetera. And they've been operating during this shutdown. So no real impact uh, too much there right now. The one thing that has been impacted is the gas tax, uh, by, of course, by the less driving that's going on. And that impacts the, the funds for our local street maintenance and also for at the county level for regional transportation projects. And SBCTA is, of course, looking at that to see what that means in the, in the future. We've not had to lay any of our employees off. Uh, we have not had to touch our economic uncertainty fund. Uh, we are segregating all of our COVID-19 expenses so we can be reimbursed later by FEMA funds. City Hall has been open since the stay at home order was uh, first initiated by, for processing permits and uh, other activities by appointment only, but it's been open. Uh, after installing some glass barriers at the front counters, we open the lobby to the public this past Wednesday, requiring, of course, social distancing and the wearing of face coverings. We have several entitled uh, projects in Highland, uh, both residential and commercial, and we look forward uh, to them uh, moving forward as the market and the economy improve. And with that, I'll uh, wait to see what kind of questions you have. Thanks, Larry. We look forward to having those projects move forward uh, as well. Um, our uh, next uh, distinguished uh, guest is uh, the good mayor of Rialto, Deborah Robertson. Welcome, Deborah. Uh, she was elected mayor in November of 2012, uh, and uh, the latest achievement in a distinguished public service career that has included 12 years on not only on the Rialto City Council, but leadership positions at the Southern California Association of Governments, uh, the San Bernardino Associated Governments, and more than 20 years with the California Department of Transportation. 
Uh, under Mayor Robertson's leadership, Rialto has gained regional and national recognition for innovation in areas of public-private partnerships, business development, and job creation. And the city's refinancing and restructuring of its water and wastewater operations have become a model for other communities in California, pumping millions of dollars into the local economy. A uh, leading voice on the regional and national infrastructure issues, Mayor Robertson chairs the public health subcommittees for SCAGS, Regional Transportation uh, Plan and Sustainable Community Strategy. As a member of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, Water Council and Metro Economics, and member of the Mayors Against Illegal Guns. I also find this one uh, uh, point about the mayor particularly interesting uh, and, and it says a lot about her heart. She's a founding uh, board member for the NFL a AFL Youth Life Skills Camp and has hosted the annual State of Women event in Rialto for the past seven years. It was recognized by uh, then Assembly Member Cheryl Brown as the 47th District Woman of the Year. Welcome and glad to have you here, uh, Mayor Roberts. Well, thank you, Carlos. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for us to also participate with your webinar. And uh, of the four mayors, I guess one of the things I would say about the city of, of Rialto amongst the four, we are probably one of the uh, early uh, incorporated communities in the early 1900s. We have some cities in San Bernardino County that were incorporated in 1800s. Uh, Rialto was incorporated in 1911. So you know we've 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 been been a, been around and we've seen a few things happen and and like uh, Mayor uh, McCallan said you know we've managed to constantly keep moving forward. The motto of the city when I came here and it continues to still be is uh, a bit bridge towards progress, and we are we're constantly moving forward. We're not uh, a city that necessarily we succumb or we find ourselves uh, too much in a financial difficulty. Strangely, I say that though, uh, but I did originally come in on council in 2000 uh, after was our city had experienced some significant uh, deficits uh, after we had indicated we had a, a fully uh, balanced budget. So I did come in at 2000 appointed and then was elected in 2002, 2006. 2010 and ran and was successful in becoming mayor in 2012 and again re-elected in 2016. The numbers, um, I won't go through all of those in terms of the size of Rialto. Rialto is a rather, uh, I'll say rather small community in comparison to the two cities that I sit to my east and to my west. We're about over 111,000 in population plus our square miles are 28 square miles. We're really very elongated. But within that area, we have an extreme diverse uh, bunch of business activities. And because of that, I think similarly, we have not really seen the, the full impacts of budget issues just yet. Yes, I think with what we uh, look to for our uh, analysts that provide us our forecasting, we're gonna look like we're pretty good. We're gonna see uh, the budget impacts. We're not seeing them immediately now, but we'll see them probably uh, down the road in a couple of quarters. But I think that we're gonna be able to survive and sustain ourselves through it because of the diversity. <laughs> We've done a lot of innovative things in Rialto. We have been one of the first to do a, enter into a concession agreement with our water and wastewater program that's allowed us to uh, stabilize. In terms of population, I would like to really speak to our employees. Yes, we have um, a full, we're a general law city. We have a full complement of employees. I would say roughly over 400, I think is our number usually. With, and the bulk of that about 70, 67% is in uh, public safety law. Uh, our police department, we have our own police department and our own fire department. We also contract or franchise with Vertec on waste. We're not seeing or foreseeing any uh, impacts to our employees just yet. We think that there's enough work to be done. We've got a lot of projects that are already on the, uh, on the board, the drawing board, they're still moving forward. Thing I would find it will be interesting the building industry association is especially a number of housing projects that we have are underway and those developers have not indicated that they're slowing. Those projects are underway. We have a lot of 
commercial development that's still underway that uh, is going to be helpful. Coming into this um, discussion this morning, I just heard on the news that you know in California we are we've just topped over two million employees, uh, people who have lost uh, their employment or reduction in the workforce. It equals to about uh, over 15% of our working community. Here in Rialto, I think uh, we have a, a solid job population, workforce going, really haven't experienced a great amount of people being impacted. We have our city hall, it's uh, still operating, counters are available, Every body is uh, working. We do, however, have the city hall closed. I anticipate we will probably have our city hall open back for our citizens. Hopefully after May 31st, we're looking to put the social distancing in and put the plexiglass up. We haven't gotten that yet. So it, the counters being open to the public, we do not have that, but there is ways that people can still interact. The impact, if anything, I would say is the community uh, having, trying to keep them informed as to what's going on and being able to respond to their needs and their calls. And as the mayor, I get the calls and fortunately staff can go out and deal with it. One, one good brimmer of hope is what I will say is that we've been able to bring our weekly farmer's market back online. And that becomes like a good point of social recognizing and respecting that we you know, ask for social distancing and of course face masks in, in order to come out. But it gives people a chance to get out and see one another. And you know, I think that's been very helpful. <laughs> yes, the county has said you know, it's optional on masks, but I too, just like uh, Mayor Bennett, we constantly saying, but it's a personal, you still need to take care of your personal responsibility, your personal health. So even though someone else is wearing a mask, you need to make sure that you can continue to be with your family, be home. And so I encourage everyone should go out in mass because handling your health and being here for the future is your responsibility. So Carlos, again, thank you. I look forward to the questions uh, as we go through them. And I think I may have Depth uh, dovetailed into one of them, but I'm sure you'll ask it again. Thank you. That's quite all right. Thank you for your your insights, um, Madam Mayor. And um, last but not least, uh, you know, w w every time I go in and talk uh, with uh, our friends at the great city of Montana and have a chance to talk with uh, Mayor Aquanetta Warren, I, I can't help but uh, uh, think about the years I spent uh, in my youth uh, growing up in the village of Heritage in Fontana and it's always feels like you know, going home and uh, whenever we're, we're talking so it's great to have you uh, here Mayor Warren and a few words about uh, Aquanetta Warren. Uh, she was elected to the, the city of uh, Fontana uh, as the first female and African-American mayor in December of 2010 and re-elected uh, again in uh, subsequent years, including most recently in 2018. And since taking office, Mayor Warren uh, has and continues to be a strong advocate for economic development, jobs, affordable housing, public safety, a healthier community, and fiscal integrity. Under her uh, stewardship uh, as mayor, the city of Fontana was named the fourth most prosperous city in the U.S. Quite an accomplishment with a population uh, over 100,000 residents in that distinction. Uh, as well as being recognized as one of the most prosperous cities in California. Uh, so great uh, accolades for the city. And from the f uh, first day as mayor, uh, when she was inaugurated, she's emphasized uh, the city of Fontana being open for business. And we can certainly attest to that at, at the BIA and works directly with the, the and closely in uh, with the Fontana Chamber of Commerce to support the needs of the business community. Uh, this effort was rewarded in, in 2017 with the city being ranked fourth in California in the five-year annual growth of retail sales. And uh, Mayor Warren also represents Fontana on various committees at the regional, state, and federal level. For example, she was appointed to serve on the Intergovernmental Policy Advisory Committee to focus on trade issues. And also, I think this says uh, a, a lot about her heart in the community. Since 2011, she's raised uh, over a half million dollars for the Fontana Boys and Girls Club through 
her annual Mayor's Gala. Welcome, Mayor Warren. Thanks for being here today. We almost were on, both on mute there, so we'll have to have you come off mute there, Aquanetta. Get off of there. Okay, there you go. Right. All right. The floor uh, is yours. Thanks so much for putting this panel together. As always, uh, people are talking about, are you tired of Zoom calls? Probably so, but it beats getting on the freeway, so I'm happy because we can have these discussions in person so we can continue to have them. Let's all do that. Uh, Fontana is a town, uh, it, we call it a small town, but a big place. Uh, Fontana is about 42.48 miles, and we have over 213,000 residents. And we're, we're almost at 69% on our census capture. We took it over, and it's moving. So we're looking at being the largest city in the Inland Empire. And along with large means larger problems too, but also larger opportunities. Uh, we've got a robust uh, economy. It is being impacted by COVID. Our, our consultants have already told us because of the sales tax, we're gonna probably lose about 40%. That's major, I'm not gonna play that off. Uh, but we have been able to say, we're gonna look at it quarterly. We have no plans of laying anybody off. This is the time to get to work and get everyone else back to work. Uh, I was just interviewed by CBS a week ago, and they asked me basically, what is up with your unemployment rate? It's really not gone bad. It's still it's losing, but it's not what you would think it would be. We have a diverse employment industry. You know, I'm Warehouse Warren, coming and going. And we believe in logistics, transportation, distribution. And guess what really was needed? That. We also have the Great Kaiser Hospital in our town, and they're not, they're not rolling under. So we're hoping soon we can get everybody back on level and then we can begin to really work together to recreate, to rebuild together. So with that, uh, we have the uh, footprint of some of the nicest parts and facilities in the Inland Empire. Those are closed right now, but they're passive. We did close down the parking lots, but we're starting to see a little bit of reopening that can occur, but we're not having any leagues or sports right now because that's not within the governor's orders. Uh, one of the things that we just recently done, because I'm sure there'll be questions all the way around the impact, is we just established and announced in a press conference. It was a virtual press conference. At 10 o'clock today, the big film is coming out, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. But uh, we have created what we call the Fontana Economic Task Force, and that is part of our hashtag Fontana Together and we're working closely with the Fontana Chamber. We just sent out yesterday afternoon over 20,000 surveys to emails to our business community asking them to complete that survey and get it back into us ASAP. We're gonna collect that data to, the purpose of that is to engage our business community and find out what their needs are. Uh, the next part of that is we have had ongoing uh, commitments to making sure our residents are getting their needs I do a weekly update to the public. It includes speakers. Uh, I think the most popular one was Dr. Veronica Kelly when she came to talk about mental health issues because we're trying to make sure we keep our people healthy. We have our seniors being called on a daily basis. Our staff is calling 348 seniors a day. We're participating in any county program that outreaches to our public. And on a national level, I've been on the calls for United States Conference of Mayors where I'm an advisory task force member. And we just got commissioned for our workforce um, economic and uh, technology committee, which I'm the chair. We're going to start having hearings and making sure that we are in line with the administration to make sure that mayors get a voice on how this all comes back. Uh, the other, uh, program that we are looking at very clearly is we have our city hall closed, but we haven't stopped the beat. As a matter of fact, we're finding that a lot of our staff is becoming more productive working at home. Hint, hint. So we're looking at that. So we, we don't have our facilities open yet, but they're ready. Uh, in my last update, and I'm willing to share that with you, Carlos, to send out to your membership, I did, I actually did a demonstration of what City Hall is going to look like. We've got our plexiglass going up. We've got markers on the floor. We're getting ready. And that's the thing. Get ready because we're going to get reopened. 
It was not discouraging, but I was a little worried yesterday at the County Board of Supervisors meeting about the timing. But we all know we have to do this right because we have to keep people safe. So I don't question that. But I'm hoping that the county does send that in today so that the governor can approve it and we can start seeing, because basically people are not running in the middle of the street yet, but people aren't listening anymore. They don't want to be inside anymore. But a lot of people that have chosen to stay inside you know, God with you, just stay inside. That's what I've been telling people. The other uh, program that I think uh, that has really touched my heart during this whole process is working with our pastors. I had the honor of being allowed on the call with uh, my pastor, Danny Carroll from Water of Life, who's leading a great uh, movement to get the churches open safely. And I was very pleased that the county supervisors has included the mayors in their conversations and has actually included churches where they too can apply for the new program that the county has put forth, which I think is wonderful to make people COVID-19 compliant. So I was on a conference call this morning with some of the smaller churches and they're gonna apply and they're happy about that. They feel like they're being listened to. But that call is a call that, um, Pastor Dan did with over 4,000 churches throughout the state of California. And they do not, they consider themselves essential. And I understand the president is moving in that direction with CDC also, something to get ready for. But our city is strong, but we're not stupid. We're not blind. We know we're going to have major problems. We're going to probably incur over 15 million over a two year period, a shortfall. So my goal as a mayor, and I'm sure the other mayors on this call are following and doing the same direction, I'm going to be a forceful, accurate voice for the IE to make sure that we try to get the feds to backfill us and that we try to get the state to backfill us. So those are the things right now that are pending on my heart because we provide services, needed services, street sweeping, public safety, all the things that people really recognize as crucial and not just getting a certificate from someone that flew on a plane on the weekend. So it's important that we keep moving forward and we eliminate any impediments. And I'll tell you, I hear from a lot of the developers and business community that our plan check-in is off the chain. They're at home working like little bees. So we'll continue to evaluate and look at what works best for our community and I continue to love the fact that we coordinate all together and work together. And I appreciate the efforts of the BIA. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor Warren. And uh, the idea of uh, being a strong and accurate voice for our region. Uh, we're fortunate not only to have you in that role, but um, each of your, your colleagues here uh, continue to um, provide key leadership, not only for your cities, but at a regional level. And as each of you were sharing uh, the overview uh, from your city perspective, uh, you, you did allude to um, one of the, the key areas on the COVID-19 impact on, on, on the budget. And just curious about um, if you could share a little bit about um, kind of what you're forecasting, uh, maybe not in specific numbers if you're still in the midst of your budget, but just you get a sense that there is going to be uh, you know, budget sh shortfall areas, or will there be some services that, uh, you know, you'll, you'll have to uh, dip into reserves to keep uh, funded? Give us a, a sense of the, the, the impact on, on the budget moving forward. And uh, why don't we start with uh, our um, Chino Hills Mayor Bennett. Surely, uh, and I'll run through this real quick for you. Our city's forecasting about $3.6 million reduction in revenue resulting from COVID-19. That's about a million dollars in sales tax, $431,000 in transit occupancy tax, street sweeping parking tickets, 81,000, community development building and plan review activity, a million dollars, uh, community services program cancellations, 840,000, passport services, 82,000, and other general fund services, uh, 91,000. The good news is, and we can get into this as we're talking, we're going through, we have a workshop for next Wednesday on our 2020-21 uh, budget. Uh, because of the fact that we do quarterly adjustments to our budget, and we have been working on this uh, actively, it looks like we're gonna have a balanced budget 
And I'm happy to say that uh, we won't have to dip into our reserves, although our uh, unrestricted reserves in our city is at 83% of our budget, uh, which is absolutely unbelievable because most cities are at about 10 to 15%. I think, Carlos, you were sharing that your city is at about 60%. So we're in a very unique situation, but that's what those reserves are all about. It's a rainy day fund. We never thought it would be a COVID-19 fund, but uh, so far we're in good shape. Thank you. That's great to hear. And uh, to, uh, to Mayor Robertson, any thoughts on uh, the upcoming budget and, and the impacts of COVID-19? Well, you know what, similarly uh, to uh, our, we are in the process of getting ready to prepare for our budget workshop. You know, we're looking at 20, this 2020, well, 2019-20, we're not really seeing uh, great uh, significant impacts. We are seeing some reductions. It, it will apply to the sales tax. Right now, we're looking at um, the sales tax revenue for the 2019-2020, the budget, we'll probably see about a 3.8% reduction on that. And that's, that's looking at less than a million dollars in the sales tax right now. In the 2021 period, it'll, it's projected to be about 3.2 because as we move to get things back up, sales tax activity ha will pick up in Rialto, but uh, we just recently, you know, in the last three years, opened up the Renaissance Marketplace. So the Renaissance area had not always been a big, uh, it was not a factor in our sales tax activity. Probably the big driver in our sales tax was gasoline uh, activities and, of course, various retails. So we're anticipating that we will see some reduction on the 2021, and that will be probably, it's projected to be about 3.2. We're a city also that we've managed to, after coming out of previous, uh, I want to call it kind of falling off the cliff deficit issues, we've tried to maintain what we call at least a 50% reserve to our operating budget. Now, there's always a debate as to what does that mean and is that, you know, total cash or is that, uh, you know, dollars that have been committed elsewhere, but they are in the reserve area. But we're at a point where I think I could say that we're not seeing the need to have to do any impacts to staff. When we talked about immediate impacts of uh, COVID, of course, we've done some shifting and we had to uh, gear up for certain types of equipment for our uh, personnel and all of that. We were anticipating it'll be attributed back to FEMA and to the disaster. We declared uh, our city in a state of emergency uh, March 12th, the same day that the county did. And we've been in a full uh, EO, you know, EMC, EOC mode. And so we've had to maybe momentarily divert some cost or incur cost for getting what we call the what PPEs, uh, protective uh, equipment and all of that so that our services continue to go forward in our community as it relates to police and fire. But it's uh, hard to say right now what you know what the impacts were going to be down the road uh in the 21 22 budget we'll be looking to bounce back i echo the same we're open for business we're moving business we were very aggressive uh mayor warren calls herself uh warehouse warren uh i think people have started to begin to feel that you know my thing for some reason i'm aligned with the truckers but you know what in the trucking industry we're logistics we are inland port. We were an inland port before we started having all of these warehouses. I did my master's just so somebody else, I did my master's at the Port of Los Angeles in Maritime. We were in 1985 de designated as the inland port. Anything that comes through LA and Long Beach Harbor has to come through the Inland Empire. That's just it. Before that, you had the railroad industry. It, why, it's called a hub, Colton Hub. We, the, I always think about that the footprint of our area in the Inland Empire has always been essential and vital to uh, the economic vitality for the whole state. So with that said, you know, I think we're not going to be able to change. I, and I won't say that I, I, I love that she calls herself Warehouse Warren, own it, because that's one of the things that have now caused us to not see 
such an impact. We have people who are still working in those warehouses and truckers that are truck driving. And I have to say, if it wasn't for the warehouses, then the trucks wouldn't be here. So you have to kind of find a balance. And the trucks and the warehouses and the products that your industry looks for, they are essential to a vibrant economy. And so I'll leave it at that. But I, you know, it's, I don't want to put out the scare and things because we, we plan on managing it. We're not throwing our hands in the air and going, oh my God, I don't know what we're going to do. We plan on managing it. Sure. Well, I think it's realistic to anticipate, um, you know, some type of impact from, you know, what, what's Absolutely. happening here. Uh, so just being able to understand the economic implications for the city and what type of services um, could be uh, affected is um, critical. Uh, we have some, Callen, let me just say, we have some oh. essential road infrastructure projects. And I just told my city manager the other day is that strangely enough, uh, the pandemic doesn't do anything for a pothole. A pothole is still going to be a pothole and we still have to address it. So, and they were, we were dealing with potholes before COVID-19 and we're going to deal with them to maintain the quality of life in this community. I'll leave it at that. Well, when we finally can be off the stay at home, uh, it, it would be nice to not have a, a, a bunch of, of uh, new potholes for sure. So, uh, Mayor McCallan, any thoughts on, uh, you had, I think, mentioned that the budget seemed to be uh, looking uh, pretty consistent. If, uh, we, uh, we do a two-year budget in the city of Highland. We're in the second year of our, uh, our current budget, and uh, uh, we do uh, quarterly adjustments to that budget. Like I said, as long as the economy begins to recover and we don't have uh, this uh, thing run on for another year or more, uh, we should be in pretty good shape because most of our funding comes through property taxes rather than sales taxes. Uh, if it goes beyond that, then uh, we, will, we will start our budget process for the next two years after the election in November, uh, probably sometime in January, we'll have our first uh, workshop. And we develop our budget based on uh, uh, looking at uh, projects and prioritizing projects for the next two years. And uh, once the council agrees on what needs to be done and puts it in priority order for the next two, two years, uh, then the budget just falls out from that. So we don't have really any arguments over dollar amounts after we've decided on what needs to be done over the next two years. So in the near term, uh, there's, I don't believe that we'll have much of an impact on our budget. We will certainly have some uh, budget adjustments uh, as we move forward uh, through the year, but uh, I don't expect a big impact. Well, that's uh, good news. And uh, Mayor Warren, uh, love to hear about um, budget implications and then uh, we'll go to you again for a second part question and we'll go to everyone about as well as what um, coming off of your budget comment uh, what has the city looked to do um, before and during the pandemic to help encourage residential development as we've been uh, you know, significantly impacted on that front as an industry. So first the budget and then some steps the city has taken uh, to work with the industry. Take it away. We, uh, we continue to uh, come up with innovative ways. One of the biggest uh, changes that we're making, and we've announced it, but we're gonna really go at it in the next two weeks, is that anyone with existing plans or developments that they're working on in the city of Fontana, we are giving you an additional year to get those in. That is significant when you look at people trying to get their construction loans, trying to get their entitlements together. We wanna to make it as comfortable as we can so that you not walk away from your projects, but you continue. And I'm assuming that as this comes out, more cities will begin to look at that. So you're gonna have an additional year. And I've had nothing but uh, great comments about that. We're your partner. And we're gonna have to do that because if you look at what is going on at the state level, particularly for the May revise, uh, there's gonna be redirect of significant funding away from housing programs, particularly housing. So we're all paying attention to that. But I think it's prudent on our part 
all of us to not start a scare, but let's also recognize that's why we're going to quarter reviews because no one really can predict. Uh, HDL, which handles all our economic indicators, because everything done in Fontana is very strategic has already announced that 40%. Most cities at our size are looking at 40%. And we've had a few people come in and opt out of paying sales tax in addition. Uh, not major uh, numbers, but we know it's coming. Uh, and then we're keeping our eye on what the state does because they seem to be giving all the relief, uh, forgetting that as they relieve us, they will be cut short too. So the funding sources we're keeping an eye on we're not changing our mode of business. We're looking at existing projects. Actually, we increased our infrastructure uh, programs, our capital uh, during this time because less people are on the streets. So we are taking full advantage. You can't go anywhere in Fontana without a cone up. So we're moving. We did not uh, take that opportunity to go to sleep. We just kept going forward. But quarterly will allow us to better see how we are doing and like I said, we, my focus and my colleagues were clear on not cutting work staff because we need staff to help us get along right at this point. So that's what we're working with right now. Thank you. And uh, we'll just go down the line as far as any, any thoughts on uh, from each city uh, approaches towards our industry and uh, pre-pandemic and during the pandemic and uh, open it up to uh, Mayor Robertson, Mayor McCallan, Mayor Bennett, any thoughts? Well, Island's always open for business. Uh, we, uh, we of course, are the uh, considered, I guess, the bedroom community for the county seat, San Bernardino. Uh, so we have a lot of residential uh, uh, rather than a lot of commercial. In fact, our commercial is, is very limited. That's why we are not as heavily dependent on sales tax. Uh, we have, like I said before, several entitled projects, uh, residential projects, which have been entitled for a number of years now. Uh, for, I guess, the appropriate time in the market to, to start building. And, and some of the issues have been, of course, with kangaroo rats and all of that nonsense about uh, preserving habitat for, for uh, them as opposed to developing the properties. Uh, however, we do have uh, uh, one project uh, that is beginning to, I think, move forward, and that's the Mediterra project uh, with uh, Camille Berry has in, uh, in the eastern part of our city. As you may recall, we had a, uh, a 3,600 a uh, uh, home project that was called the uh, Harmony Project, which uh, uh, had to was opposed by uh, uh, the trade union, uh, some of the trades, and uh, they stirred up opposition in the city, and it had to go to a referendum. And uh, before the referendum was voted on, uh, Orange County, who owns the land, decided to to uh, pull it back uh, because there were two environmental lawsuits that that required some work. So it never got voted on by the people, but that project, I believe, will come back at, uh, in the near future uh, and potentially uh, will have uh, some major development going on because I think, I think it's important because we have a, such a housing shortage in the state and in this area, I think it's uh, the project was good from the standpoint it had a, a good mix of of housing types and uh, affordability. And uh, over half of the uh, of the project was open space, uh, and it was unfortunate that uh, it got uh, so much opposition uh, because of inaccurate information that was put out by those that uh, were opposing the project. But I think Orange County plans to uh, resubmit at some point, and we, we're encouraging them to do that, and we'll see how that moves forward. Well, we're keeping our fingers crossed on, on that, uh, Mayor McAllen, and I'll, I'll just say that our industry is, is appreciative of the approach 
uh, by Rialto, by Chino Hills, by Montana, and by Highland in, in reaching out to us whenever there's a discussion uh, about a fee increase, uh, particularly in, in these times, how proactive uh, the cities are in uh, speaking with us, getting our input. I think that's a, a best practice that we're appreciative of. I uh, think more times than not, uh, you know, fees are, are kept uh, in check or there's incremental uh, adjustments and there uh, clearly has been a higher sensitivity in, in the midst of the COVID-19 by each of the cities to uh, not only um, maybe think about uh, putting off uh, an increase or, or keeping things in place, but also uh, we are appreciative of the dialogue we've been having on uh, the state requirement of vehicle miles travel reduction and all working together uh, to make sure when that deadline comes up in July that uh, we've had the input uh, as an industry and working with your staff to try to figure out this uh, you know, new approach. Uh, we're also uh, looking forward to uh, working with your jurisdictions and uh, urging the governor uh, to put, put off that implementation potentially for uh, a year. And what I would ask as uh, we're looking at uh, some of the uh, questions from uh, the, the audience is uh, they would like to know, uh, open question, rapid fire here, uh, what action can the county or the state or the federal government take to help your city? So maybe I'll just open that question up and you can, you know, any level of government. So if the county, state or feds, what could they do to help Rialto, Chino Hills, Fontana and uh, Highland? And we'll, we'll start with Mayor Warren and then we'll go down the line here. I have to say right away, uh, assist us in backfielding. Uh, they appointed in their CARE Act to monies to populations of 500,000 or more. In the particular case of County of San Bernardino, County of San Bernardino has 2.17 million people and only 317,000 are in unincorporated areas. So they use some of the city's population to qualify for those funds. So we are all working hard to get the feds to look at that and get them to do their next bill or to uh, redo their billing uh, requirements so that the cities that are under 500,000 have the same uh, uh, funding pr uh, process, but we're going a step further and saying backfill us. So based on the CDBG formulas. The other part is we all know now that we will have to put a little bit more power at the local level and not depend on people to tell us when and how to do things. So that will be a good step, a uh, better definition of general law charters and see if down the future we don't have these problems because we are here on the map, we see what we need to get done. Thank you and Mayor yeah. Robertson, I know you work closely at various levels of government as well. Any thoughts on um, that question on what county, state or federal government could do to help your city? Well, I would echo definitely what uh, uh, Mayor Warren has said, we've, we've been on uh, weekly conference calls with the county uh, uh, chair, you know, initiated by uh, Chairman ha um, Hagman, Kurt Hagman, and trying to make sure they understand that the dollars that they've received and their concerns about making sure they're expending them properly, that they don't have to later come back and determine that the feds would say that they, they weren't properly spent. It's a bottleneck. In the meantime, everything flows. It's continuing to flow from the feds through the state down to the county and into the cities. We really have to get a better understanding that we are the ones that are on the ground. We're running the operation. We're the ones that are servicing the, the constituents. Everyone that is going up, it's about the people in our communities and being able to service them. So we have layers. We need to figure out how do you streamline or at least I feel that we got to figure out how do you streamline the resources that need to come back to serve the communities, in fact, and cut out somewhat of the middlemen. We have a group uh, of a coalition of, of mayors that uh, I will acknowledge that the mayor of, I uh, want to say it's, uh, huh, uh, was it of Tustin? Uh, help me out, Mayor Warren, but we formed a, a, a group to really- The mayor of Fullerton, Jennifer Fullerton. Fitzgerald. Yes to really fully focus on making sure they understand that the mayors with the governor 
are the ones, are the key on the ground in their communities having to address and deal with things. The other thing that probably that if people could help us out is we haven't seen, at least to my knowledge, any relaxing or I, and you know, I'll, I'll uh, uh, applaud the fact that we came up with a way to move forward regionally when we are going to allow from the regional level to take some time to deal with the arena and our, our next project. But at the same time in the arena for those who have regional housing needs or our connect SoCal, but we did not stop move, we agreed to move forward our transportation and the conformity proposal <laughs> because we've got major projects that are gonna be underway. Uh, for example, for me in Fontana and Rialto, along with the county, we're moving forward a reconstruction of the Cedar Avenue interchange. We're all gonna have to figure out how that, that's not just a local project, that is a significant project. And we have to figure out how we move forward and keep those things going because they're well overdue. And at the same time, realize that there's regulations, there's deadlines, and all of those deadlines are not necessarily always being aligned with uh, what we're supposed to respond to, but we haven't seen any relief. So I would say understanding you have housing elements, you asked about projects. I just wanna say, I have a major uh, residential development that's it's clear to go, it's moving, and that's the Lido development. Before this started, they were moving and they were already going to start for one of their phases, which was going to be over 674 homes. Not to mention another development, Christopher Homes, is already underway at 168. And then we have small infill pocket projects of 60 or 70. Thus, we need the housing. We need the housing. I don't think anybody will deny that. But between the environmental issues we have to get through and we get past those hurdles, then we have to deal with, um, as she said, and I agree, people's ability to get the funding, the, con the construction loans to move forward. So it would be helpful if everybody understands how all of it has to work together. You can't just expect one move to delay one thing and at the same time not get that same consideration at the state and federal level. Thank you, Mayor Robertson. And Unfortunately, time has flown and we're short on time. And I'd just like you to take one minute each and uh, just share with the, the members of the BIA, uh, not only our builders, our subcontractors, our trade partners, the multitude of, of businesses that are part of the economic engine that is uh, the, the home building industry. Uh, share a little bit about your view and commitment to meeting the housing demands in your city? What would you uh, have us take away as families are still uh, in the midst of this now more than ever needing a array of housing options at all socioeconomic levels? I'll start with Mayor Bennett. What would be your takeaway you would like us to have at the BIA? Well, Carlos, as you know, I spent 18 years or 15 years on the planning commission before becoming a uh, city council member. And I am a firm believer in property owners' rights. I think that developers have the right to develop their property consistent with the general plan, consistent with and com uh, compatible with other surrounding properties. I think the thing that we have all forgotten is that, you know what, cities are the foundation of this nation. That's where people live. We at the city level are the ones that have the employment, have the residents. We are, apparently government has forgotten that they answer to us. We seem to be at the bottom of the barrel. We have federal, we have state, we have county, we have cities. Let's wake up people. You know, if you don't like the way things are going, get active get to the voters box and start voting in people that are consistent with you and you, what your beliefs are. Because if we don't vote and stand up for ourselves, we're not going to get help down at the local level. So we must, must work on better support of local government. And right now that comes like Antonetta said earlier, we need some backfill. Uh, there's a lot of revenue loss because of COVID-19. It all surrounds jobs, employment, uh, people are hurting and these federal subsidies that are coming out and these, you know, these three 
point or three trillion dollars, two point three trillion dollars. People got to wake up and realize how much money that is and how little effect it really is having on the residents that live in our cities. So residents of our city support BIA and support the, the fact that we need to, to grow and we need to build homes. The old NIMBY approach of not in my backyard, you have to realize you may have your slice of heaven in your neighborhood and you don't want anybody else to build homes in your area, but you know what? People need places to live. And employers, they base things on rooftops, so do commercial developers. If there's not homes around to support the commercial development, it doesn't happen. So let's wake up America and let's remember that we are the foundation of this nation. And as long as we have an active voice in what's going on and say enough is enough, let's help us out at the local level. That's the only way this is going to change. Thank you for that call to action. Mayor Warren, we shared a little bit about uh, the takeaway you'd like the BIA members to have as well as those who are aspiring uh, homeowners in, in need of quality housing in the city of Fontana. And you're on, you are on mute. <laughs> we, uh, my house got crowded all of a sudden. We have approximately 79, uh, 75 property owners whose entitlement were going to be jeopardized when COVID-19 hit. We are extending uh, that they don't have to worry about their entitlements for an, an additional year. And they only need to get in touch with our city. Uh, call up our um, planners and everybody and, and get on that list. But you have been provided a one-year extension. And we are not going to stop entertaining developments. So we will work with you in any way we can. We're doing it daily. And the bigger takeaway is what all my colleagues just said. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there's time. The time has come that people begin to respect the local government for what we are. We are the ones getting it done. So we are not going to stop talking about it, and we are not going to stop fighting for it. Thank you, Mayor Warren. We'll go with Mayor Robertson and then Mayor McCallan. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll back clean up. Okay. All right, Carlos, no problem. Uh, I think I, I said it, and I, I want to echo what they said, but Art, uh, you know, besides what this country is all about, one of the things that it has always been a paramount in is pride in ownership. Everybody wants, if we move away from a person in our community wanting to have that opportunity to purchase their own home, their first home, or the housing stock for whatever reason isn't there and they can't participate, then we're moving them out to uh, an area where that whole goal of having ownership and what I would say fully be in, all in to the step of, to what our community and our country is about. Ownership, property taxes, yes, but expecting a, a better quality of life. I'm not saying that we should not have people who also can live into uh, lease facilities, apartments, luxury condos, what have you. But there are people who are starting families and they are always looking for. Uh, Art mentioned he was on the planning commission. I was and I was on the airport. Commission, but one of the things I used to listen to the planners talk about, uh, they didn't like the house, it was too small, uh, the garage was this and that and that. And I will say, but you're not buying the product. You were already, the person who's looking for a home and their first home, they're going to be happy. They'll have that choice to look at a product. So I echo that we have to continue to move forward. The NIMBY, not in my backyard, is so unfortunate because. You, just like he gave you the sanctuary coming home and you've got your little piece of heaven. But we also have fallow land um, that needs to be developed. It does nothing for the community uh, or anything if you have it, unless it's designated as open space. And then people can participate and use the trails. But in most of our cases, it's land that's been intended to be developed. And because of economic up and down, it hasn't happened. And I, you know, I just say we, we got to have a balance, not only on the housing, but on commercial development. I have a hotel that is coming forward and is still planning on moving. I love what Mayor Warren said, and I'm going to look and make sure we don't have anyone that's going to lose their entitlement. And you will probably be the first one to follow that suit if we haven't already done it, because 
there's already investment, a financial investment in everything someone does when they come to our <coughs> counter with plans. So I'll leave it at that. I want to thank the BIA for being supportive of our communities. Uh, and I also want to thank the BIA to always know that they love when we can agree to disagree and you still love me. <laughs> That's why, you know, we, we, don't, we don't expect to agree uh, even with our best friends 100% of the time, uh, but it's always, have, uh, always nice to be uh, invited to the table to have the discussion. So we appreciate that. Mayor McCallan, bring, always, bring it home with your uh, uh, parting comments to the industry and to those who are aspiring to own a home or have a quality place to live in, in the great city of Highland. But we always have our, our, our motto is come home to Highland and we're, we're ready to, to do whatever it takes to, to help get the homes built. I firmly believe, uh, as uh, Mayor Bennett said, that, uh, uh, that pro individual property rights are, are very important. If uh, the property owner has the right to build uh, or do with his property what he wants to, as long as it's within the zoning and within the current laws, et cetera. I also believe that uh, the, one of the best ways to free up lower end uh, housing for our, our uh, workforce is, is to build market rate housing because the, there's a pent up demand uh, right now, I think, for, to move up uh, for people that they, they want housing and they, they're ready to do it. And uh, that's uh, what's causing all of the rents, uh, if you will, to, to go up is because we don't have enough housing. Uh, unfortunately, the state uh, did away with redevelopment agencies, which was a major uh, source of funding uh, for us to move forward in that area. They still haven't done anything to modernize CEQA, which is uh, the biggest detriment to housing development uh, in the state, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and uh, we need to do something about that. This current uh, uh, DMT requirement as a result of SB 743 is something that I uh, and others on the regional council and SCAG uh, vehemently tried to get uh, changed because it really affects cities like Highland and, and others in in the uh, San Bernardino County that don't have uh, transit, don't have uh, transit occupancy development and uh, will have a severe impact on cities like, like Highland. And I, I look forward to supporting whatever we can do to, to try to get that delayed or changed or, or whatever needs to be done. I think that will severely impact any future uh, housing development in cities like mine. And with that, thank you very much. You took the words right out of my mouth there, Mayor McCallan, on that last point. And we look forward to working with you and each of uh, the mayors uh, on, on that effort. And thank you again, a heartfelt thanks uh, to each of you uh, for continuing to have an open door policy for our industry. You set the tone as leaders on the council we're grateful for the collaborative nature of our relationship and working together to meet the housing demands in each of your cities. Uh, on behalf of the BI of Alderby chapter, uh, we just are so grateful for your leadership. Thank you for taking the time to share your insights today. Uh, we understand that there's tremendous challenges ahead, but we take heart in knowing we have leaders like you uh, to work with and to get through this challenge together. So uh, be safe, be well. God bless you, and we'll look forward to working with you in the near future. For the audience members that would like to be able to get in touch with each of the mayors and their council, we'll be sure to be posting this video with their respective contact information so you can follow up with them as well. In the meantime, have a wonderful day. Have a great uh, weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. We'll Thank you, you Carlos. Bye-bye. Thank have you. Have a good weekend. You too. Happy Memorial Day. Happy Memorial Day to everyone. Uh, All right. Remember, freedom is not free. Well said. <laughs>